Welcome to another exciting Bible study with Reverend Dr. James A. Duncan, pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church. Faith study in the Word is designed to keep you fired up about your walk with the Lord. Fired up about our faith study in the Word with Pastor Duncan, author, teacher, and long-term educator with a burning desire to see every believer live a full life of faith in the redeeming power of God. This can only happen when we develop a hunger and thirst for studying the Word, God's Word. Thanks for joining us in tonight's study. Good evening. Praise the Lord. Come on, give God some praise. We are in another Fired Up About Our Faith Bible Study. I am Pastor Duncan, and tonight we're going to continue with our exciting series about walking in the kingdom of God. Grab somebody. As you know, we've been talking about the Sermon on the Mount. We've been looking at particular scriptures about that. And last week we did an exciting study. If you missed it, you got to go back and find it on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. After that, uh, we looked at, before that, we looked at adultery. Well, tonight we're going to look at another exciting topic coming out of the Sermon on the Mount. We give you an explanation of this sermon, but it is so exciting. What about if you spend your entire Christian life going to church, praying, reading scriptures, and don't make it to heaven? What about if you say Jesus is Lord? And you still don't make it to heaven. Tonight, I want to talk about a topic because Jesus was not pulling any punches. What he was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount is the standard of living as Christian. How come it's so easy for you to be a Christian when you know, when we know, I'll put myself in it, we really aren't that good of people? How come we can just live this Christian life and go on because you and I both know? We just don't live this Christian life like that. I want to tell you this, Christian, the Christian life is hard. Anybody trying to live it? And it's only easy when we live it in Christ. So gather around. This is an exciting topic. I'm going to talk about phony Christians versus real Christians. That's right. I want to talk about which one are you? I'm going to talk about tonight, are you authentic? And do you even want to be? Or have you got this Christian thing so down that you're ready to say, I know I'm going to heaven? Well, you might not be as convinced as we look at this. And just for those who say, well, I am those who believe in eternal security. So do I. The problem is not whether or not you have, whether or not there is eternal security. The problem is by your actions, by your fruit, by your life, can you say, I'm really saved? Man, we really lay on that grace stuff hard. And I know I need grace. But let's look at what Jesus Christ said as we shift our talking about the kingdom of God. Right? So the first thing is, are there phony Christians? We started this text talking about the kingdom of God and what God's message was to us. That we walk in this power and we're blessed because we walk in this kingdom power. But what you need to realize is that there are many places in this text where Jesus talked to the scribes and Pharisees, religious leaders, religious folk like us, talked to them about the fact that they were hypocrites. The word hypocrites is a Greek word, and when you sound it out, there's the Greek, but here is the actual phonetic spelling of the word, eupocritus. Eupocritus is you are just acting. You are someone playing a part. You're someone who is acting like I'm saved and I got my lines down. But we hide all the outtakes. <laughs> all the times when people aren't looking. Stay with me. Are you phony or real? This is, and just in case you think, well, I'm going to turn this off because I know I'm real. Well, the Bible speaks a lot about that. Matthew 23, 27. Look what Jesus said. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. There it is again, you procretists. You are just like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside you are full of dead man's bones. Write that scripture down. Jesus said there's some Christians, we look good on the outside. He's not even talking about dress now. He's talking about the way we put on. We put on good. We got the title. And we wear our titles. I'm a deacon. I'm a trustee. I'm a nurse. But how is your heart? What is your heart saying? Watch this. 
And not only that, so you, in Matthew 23, 28, look what he said to him. There's the word again, but now it's hypocrisy. Look what he said. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. God says you don't mind stepping outside the bounds of Christianity anytime you feel like it, but then you step back in and go into your prayers. Watch this. This is what God is talking about. Matthew 23, 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut up the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter yourselves, and you don't want anybody else to enter. There are some people, your walk is so devastating that you keep other folk from being Christians. You saw some Christians that if you were not saved, you would say, I'm glad they're not the poster child of Christianity. I'm glad they're not the ones. Because what happens is your actions and the way you live can stop someone else from wanting Christ. You can be in the house with somebody and they can be very pious in the way they treat you and the way they talk. But is their heart really full of Christianity or are they just playing a role? <laughs> you know, playing a role means that I'm playing a role. Uh, I play the Christian role when I need to. Uh, I can play the critical, criticizing role when I need to. I can play the judgmental role when I need to. But when all things are done, I still think I'm all right. Well, tonight, Jesus is saying not so. It was not just the scribes and Pharisees. This last verse gives us implication that the hypocrites don't enter or walk in the kingdom. He's saying, you don't make it in and you don't want anybody else. This is the part that affects us. That's what he says. Not just scribes and Pharisees don't make it in. Us, nowadays, those of us who are walking in God, are we sure we are walking properly in the Lord? Let's take a look at it. James 1.26. James said this, New Testament. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, his religion is worthless. I'll let you see that one. If anybody thinks they are religious, but you don't bridle your tongue. You just let anything come out of your mouth to hurt anybody at any time. Then you got to check and see whether or not you are truly religious. How about Matthew 27 and 21? Not, this is the part that gets me. Remember I said, if I say, Lord, Lord, I know Jesus is my Lord. But look what Jesus said. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of of my father. Let's talk about it. This is not all bad news. This is good news. This is going to let us know I am not a fake Christian. You heard of fake news? There's fake Christians. There's those of us who have been for years walking in the kingdom of God and think that it's easy, but the reason we don't know it is because some of us have gotten ourselves fooled. Look Galatians 6 and 7. Um, don't be misled. This is, the, this is the message Bible version. Don't be misled. God is not fooled. Whatever a man sows, he shall reap. A very timely text. Here's what God is saying. No matter how good you act, you can get an Oscar. You can win a prize as if you were on Broadway or the Academy Award. But here's the problem. God is not fooled. So tonight, please don't be mad at me. Please don't look around the room. Can I get into your heart just for a minute to share something with you that's very dangerous? But Jesus said it on the Sermon on the Mount trying to teach the principles of heaven. Look what he said. The problem is we are incarcerated in our flesh. That's right. You're locked up in this body. You can be as heavenly as you want to. But remember, in this body, I'm locked up. How many of us know we have done some things? We have said some things. We have walked places we shouldn't have walked. We thought thoughts we shouldn't have thought. I'm glad somebody can't read my mind. I'm not the only one. Because here is the reality of the gospel. Look what happens. He says, we are incarcerated by the desires of our flesh. Hmm. I said a moment ago, that's right, we locked up. I said a moment ago that Christianity is hard. Here is why it's hard. Watch what he said. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself. I'm going to stop. These are the two words you ought to say. Do you realize my total Christian life is spent 
learning to deny my flesh, to trade my will for God's will. If I don't trade my will for God's will, then I may not really be walking in the kingdom of God. Because that's what makes Christianity hard. The honest Christians, where the honest folk out there? Say, I fight sometimes to be old. Where the folk that will tell you, I have to struggle sometimes and think. Because there's some of us who think, I got it made in the shade, I'm going in. But the rest of us, please take note of what Jesus Christ said, starting with the religious people. Just because you can say, Lord, Lord, doesn't mean you're going to heaven. Amen. And look at what he said here. He said, you must deny yourself. That's what Christianity is. I got to trade in my will. Here's the problem. We are still concerned about what we want and not what God wants. And when we do, we don't trade, we don't deny ourselves. Jesus Christ said, when we do, we pick up our cross. What is our cross? My cross is that I have some habits some actions that are adverse to the kingdom and if i don't pick up my cross and say god i not only want your blessing but i want to become more like your son then i may be a phony christian let's look at it he's given us a definition the christian walk is hard because if we would be honest our whole walk is about fighting to exchange my will for god's will my biggest fight is not with other christians although there's some you know, folks that you got to wrestle with. Your biggest fight, if you're really trying to live holy, is with the stuff that's going on in your mind, in your heart. Those, are, those other things can't stop you from getting to glory. Those other things can't stop you from walking in the kingdom. Only what you think, say, and do can. And your will is so strong. It's like, God, I want to do this, but I don't want you to have this too. Or God, I'm good enough. I've looked around at other folks. I think I'm good enough. And that seems to be when God says, Hebrews 10, 26. Here's the big problem. And then I'll go right into what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. If we sin willfully, scary text, after we know the truth, there is no more sacrifice for sin. Do you see it? If we sin willfully, I don't really know of any other kind of sin there is but willful sin. I may not will myself happily, but when I allow it, it is my will, my will riding over God's will that says this will be all right for the moment because I still know I'm going to heaven. But the text tonight is, do you? Do you know that? Let's look and see. Let's learn something. Here in the Sermon on the Mount, we've looked at God's character. Uh, 5, 1 through 12, which covers the Beatitudes, was when we were, supposed to be, we were supposed to walk in the character of God. Then in the next section, we looked at the heart. That's when God said you can commit adultery with your heart. We saw that a lot of us are adulterers and adulterers. And then we looked at this section from 533, where we are tonight, until 618 is about quit pretending you're saved and start walking in your salvation. Let's look at it. When I read this, it was some heavy stuff that I saw, but in this section, he is exposing those who are fake and those who are pretending. We're gonna look at several parts of this section. Tonight, I'm hoping to cover two. We're gonna look at name dropping. You'll find out what that is. Then we're gonna look at giving up our rights, waiving our rights so we can have God's rights in our place. Loving your enemies, giving to be seen, praying to be seen, and fasting with your face all torn up like you're in pain. I'll say it again. Name dropping. We're going to talk about that one. Say, so why is that important? Because of what I just showed you. You may not be going to heaven if what you're really doing is not sincere in your life. Let's follow this. Giving up our rights. Love your enemies. Giving to be seen. Or the only time you give in church or the only time you talk about stuff is so people can see your salvation and see how great you are. You say, this is what I do. And really, is that bringing glory to God or to us? Let's talk about this next section. It's a powerful section. It's talking about swearing and an oath. I'm going to explain to you tonight something we've all heard since we were little kids on thou shalt not swear. So don't put your hand on the Bible. Don't swear about nothing. Let's talk about what God was saying. Let's look at the context of swearing. And we're not talking about cursing now because there is that dual definition 
that cursing is swearing. And it's swearing, but we're talking about swearing by an oath, by a pledge, by, by making a pledge about something. Uh, you really don't have the right to do that. This is what Jesus said. Again, I like God because he stays consistent. This is the fourth time you've heard him say, again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath. Do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. Jesus changes direction. Oh, here it is. Or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, because you really can't make one hair on your head black or white. You have no authority to do anything. Swearing by yourself really doesn't change anything, because we don't have the authority to know what we will do constantly. Anything beyond this, do what Jesus said. All you need to do is let your yes be yes, and you know we know. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. As soon as we start swearing and breaking down and swearing that we're going to do something and saying, I know I can, come on, how many of y'all know? I don't know what I'm going to be able to do from one moment till the next. But I do know what God is able to do. Follow this text. Here's the blessing in the text. Jesus changes direction. He has interpreted the sixth commandment and the seventh commandment, and now he's going to refer to the third commandment. I want you to learn something right here. So let me start down so you can see the biblical implication of an oath. So we know that's important. I just shared with you why it's important. Because once you know to do good and you don't do good, there's no more sacrifice for the things that you're doing. Let's look at it. Here's what he said. Exodus 20 and 7. This is where he came from. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. That is a powerful text. Jesus Christ is saying, if you add my name to your mess, I will not hold you guiltless. Quit taking my name if you're not really intending to do what you said. Uh, we're going we're to finish that because this is what the scribes and Pharisees were doing. They were swearing all these oaths and they were using the name of God, and God said, I'm not going to hold you guiltless. Uh, you know, we read, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Um, and then he says, he summarizes this commandment with two other passages. So, swearing the oath that Jesus is talking about, you heard what they say, now I tell you how you have to act to walk in the kingdom. All my kingdom walkers, you need to write this down. We are living in an age right now, you're talking about in this COVID virus, you better have a mouth and a heart and a life that is living honestly. The seat will no longer make it with God. We got to own up to our stuff. And I'm sitting here right now, trembling in the chair of my mic, because I know there are some places in my life I need to pick up. But this is what Jesus said. I know you guys are out there doing all that swearing. He said, well, what I need you to know, your oath is no good if you don't keep it, and you really can't keep it without me. So until you are in me, you should not be swearing by my name. That's what in vain means. He says, when you use my name in vain, meaning you don't mean, you're not going to keep the oath anyway. So why, why use his name? Here are the other two passages. Watch how Jesus ties these passages together. When a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything he said. Tall order. Don't swear, because if you use the oath by the Lord, you have to do everything you said. Deuteronomy 6.13. Fear for the Lord your God, serve him. Fear the Lord your God and serve him only. Take your oaths in his name. Contradictory. He just said, when a man takes an oath, but then this passage seems like it's giving us direction to take an oath. Because if you look at the Mosaic law and the covenant, he was trying to establish the law of his people. He wanted his people to take an oath to serve God in his name, but he wanted it to be an honest oath. And then he said, if you're not going to take a pledge and make it honest, then you need to not make it at all. Jesus' treatment of this third commandment summed up. Do not take the name of the Lord in vain. 
Jesus was about to tie these two verses together in a way those who heard him would know whether or not they were guilty. Here are the words I want you to see. Guilty of pretending and lying and making up religion to suit them. If they put your walk under a microscope, put it on a big screen, would your walk be exemplary enough that other folk could follow? All of us know there's times we should not. Watch what God tells us to do as we work out the New Testament commandment of this commandment. Jesus was concerned about several things. Write these down. First, Jesus was concerned about the honor of God's name. God's name is our deliverance. It says we have a name. God took a lot of stock in names. When he made you a Christian, or those believers, uh, Christians were first called, people were first called Christians in Antioch. When you are a Christ follower, that means you have to represent that name. But not only that, when you say, in the name of Jesus, hell shakes. When you say, in the name of Jesus, why? Because God gave Jesus a name above all names. God puts a lot of stock in your name. And you know what? When he saved you, he wanted your name to be something that was synonymous with somebody who walked in his word. Folks should have to, shouldn't have to see a bumper sticker to know you're a Christian. Amen. Folks should not have to see you carrying your, you know, your, your iPad or your, your iPhone to scriptures and see you mumbling prayers in public to say you're a Christian. It should be very apparent by the way you act. I'll never forget taking a flight and as I was sitting on the plane, there was these two old ladies. I've told this story before. And they were sitting there, and I jumped on the plane, and I was a little nervous on the flight, but these two old ladies were just going about their business. One was talking, this was talking. So I pulled out my Bible. What a mistake. One of the ladies said to me, here's the key where I want you to see. The old lady said, um, sir, uh, you're a Christian? And I said, yes, glad. I changed my whole tune. And then he said, I said, not only am I a Christian, I'm a, I'm a minister. I was a minister in training. I'm a minister. And one of the ladies says, well, you looked a little nervous, son, but your faith in Jesus, what am I telling you? They couldn't tell I was a Christian by the way I was acting. I, I, I was a little nervous, and it showed, and I grabbed my Bible for comfort, but my actions did not. They were, they were sitting there talking like they were sitting at a bingo game. And I'm sitting here, hope this plane don't crash. I don't know what's going on. Because I had not embraced the reality of my Christianity. Look what he said. He's concerned about the honor in God's name. You want to shake your world? Get into a quiet space with nobody there. Wave your hand and start saying, Jesus. Man, you are moving some mountains when you do that. Not only that, the second thing is, watch this. He shows how easily we can grieve the Holy Spirit. I got to stop here. Does everyone know this is the only thing that is a surefire way to go to hell? By grieving the Holy Spirit? All grieving the Holy Spirit is, watch this, I'm getting ready to tell a lie. Because the Holy Spirit's in me, or the Holy Spirit is trying to bring me into the kingdom, because the Holy Spirit is trying to Bring me into the path God has for me. And I ignore the Holy Spirit. I don't receive what, that's all grieving the Holy Spirit means is, the Holy Spirit saying, I love you. I got great gifts for you. I got things for you. If you continue on the path you're on, you're going to miss all the things I have for you. But the Holy Spirit is saying, if you don't grieve me, I will show you marvelous things. We thought grieving the Holy Spirit was some bad thing. Like, oh, I just grieved the Holy Spirit. No, he's saying, you just missed out on what God had for you. And it makes God said that we don't accept the blessings. I dare say there's some people waiting on a blessing right now you would have received if you could just let the Holy Spirit, watch this, let the Holy Spirit, watch it again, let the Holy Spirit change your actions. You need to change your actions. Third, he shows us how easily the devil can get in when we talk too much. I'm scared of that. He said, when we talk too much, there's a parallel verse in Proverbs that said, a multitude of words, there is an error is not lacking. <laughs> what God is saying is, if you constantly talking, 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 and you never receive or listen, then you really can allow the devil to come in. Because you heard the story before. Uh, old stories we've been telling from high school, they started out where we, you know, barely won the track meet. Finish line, photo finish, boom. 
Then the story gets a little bigger as we get older. Uh, we left everybody a half mile behind us. Boom. Then the story gets over. So I've, I've seen somebody tell a story that was a lie, and they didn't realize it was a lie until someone else came back and told them, I was there. What you're saying is not true. Because the devil will get in, and what is the devil's sin? Pride. Somebody looking at me right now. We're so concerned about who we are, what people think about us. What we should be concerned about is what do people think about God? Can they see God in me? Do you see God in me? If I'm walking, do you believe that what the scripture says, I can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover because my walk is such that I carry myself in the belief of Almighty God? Do you believe that? Fourth, he shows how easy it is to use God's name in vain. Here it is again. To make us look good. I will make myself look good at the expense of allowing myself to grow in God. I want you to think of all that. I want you to think, wow, look what he did. Look at his accomplishment. Many of us realize there are things in our life we would not be here if God had not moved some obstacles out of the way. I'll say that again. Even the talent you have belongs to God. I'll say it again. Somebody sitting there right now and you in the in the, uh, a place of feeling all secure and confident in who you are, that comes from God. You ought to thank God right now because there's been a moment in your life, I'm not by myself, where you are a basket case. Where, where, where the honest people at? I was a basket case, but I am so glad I had the word of God to lean on. Anybody with me right here? I had the word of God to hold me up and I still look good because I was trying to make him look good. Whew, that is good, y'all. I look good because I'm trying to make God look good, not because I'm trying to make me look good. The fifth thing he was concerned about, we emphasize the need for our righteousness to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. That is the major thought as he was talking to the religious leaders. And I guess the way I would put it in the context today, quit trying to walk with the crowd if God wants to take you above the crowd. Quit trying to just do good enough because everyone else. Man, there may be a supernatural miracle in your path God wants to give you, but all you're trying to do is be just like the rest of the Christians. Uh, I go to Bible study on Wednesday. Uh, well, you don't go anymore, but I listen on Wednesday. Uh, I listen to God in the morning. Uh, I, I, I might read my Bible tonight, but I'm not doing nothing. How about if God told you to take 19 days of fasting and praying and trusting Him for 19 days? Nobody else doing it. Nobody told you to do it. It wasn't a corporate act. You just did it because you love God. Not to get anything, but just because you love God. There's a difference. Let's look at the background. Why swear or make a vow? In ancient times, the way they were able to be sure someone was telling the truth, you have to remember, it was a polygamous society. There were gods everywhere. There was all kind of belief systems. Most of the times, as the Jewish people, they were being suborned or they were in uh, subordination to some other nation. So there were other gods in those nations. The only way they could find out that you were who you say you were is you took the oath that we read about uh, back in, in Deuteronomy, that you took a book oath that you swore on God's name. The oath said, I was telling the truth. So if I knew you were telling the truth, it's because you swore an oath. We didn't have the New Testament theology we have now, with all the scripture we know right now. All we had was the Old Testament covenant, or the Old Testament, or the Old Covenant. So most of the Jewish leaders were telling us how we're supposed to live. That's why most of the uh, Sermon on the Mount says, and you heard what they said, because you heard what they said. But Jesus said, let me tell you what I'm saying. I'm coming to be a personal God in your life. But if you swore an oath, or made a vow, you were believed to because all the Jews were taught not to violate their oath. If we had time, we would go into the New Testament punishment for violating your oath. Watch this. How was this oath carried out? It was settled by appealing to a greater authority such as God. A typical oath was, I swear by God Almighty, even pagans, you remember watching some of the Roman movies, they would say, I swear by the gods. That's the only way the ancient world knew that it was more than you. It was part of their mysticism and their superstition. But the Jewish people knew that there was a God who was listening. So when you took an oath by God, they knew you walking in, 
you were walking in the right place. You were, I knew you were going to pay me back. If you borrow $10 from me and you say, I swear by God, I'll give it back to you. You were obligated to pay me back for some horrible things that were going to happen to you if you were an honest person. The oath was considered as totally reliable. The Old Testament not only did not prohibit the swearing of an oath, take an oath in his name. That was Deuteronomy. But make sure you are telling the truth. That's where we're going tonight. You say, Pastor, is this going to have anything to do with New Testament? You better believe it. Jesus is taking these same passages. I did a whole exposition on the fact that Jesus did not come to do away with the law. He came to make the law true. He said, I came to fulfill the law. So anything was in the Old Testament, now I can fulfill it, and you have the Holy Spirit. They did not have the Holy Spirit, so you don't have any excuse. What I'm saying is there's not a person out there who's filled with the Holy Ghost who cannot keep their vow. When you don't keep it, it's because you have not willed yourself to walk in the power of God. Again, I just got to make sure I tell you, it is not easy. I don't know where we got this whole thing in Christianity, I can just get up and do it. No, man, this is a walk that you have to work out your own salvation. There's two people living in the house. Two of y'all listening to me. Two of you are listening to me. Watch this. Don't try to borrow somebody else's salvation. Man, you got to walk for yourself. Don't, don't pray because I prayed or, or you got a spouse that loves to pray, but you don't pray until they pray. That don't mean both of y'all on the same page. What I'm telling you is God said we have individual walks with him. Yeah. There ought to be an individual time when you are yearning for God. There ought to be a time in your life when you're riding down the road and you're yearning for God. Tell us, I know God is in my heart and I know my God is real. Tears will come down. A song on the radio ought to set your heart off. Just a thought about God ought to set your heart off. Because there ought to be an individual walk. Do you love God? You know, one of the hardest things is, that in the black tradition, the African American tradition of preaching is call and response, right? And boy, for these last five, six weeks, whatever it's been, you know, and we and preachers, come on, all my preachers out there tell you, we, we exist off the vibe, the Holy Spirit jumping in, the, the choir jumping, the, or right when I hit the right note, the organist went, yeah. oh Lord, we can't have a good time in here. And all of a sudden, now I'm sitting here preaching to empty pews. You know what I had to do? After I transitioned, I had to really think. Was, was my preaching, now, you know, you got to remember, I was not doing anything wrong, and I'm still, I can't wait to see y'all. I can't wait to see y'all. I can't wait to see y'all. But I had to learn that who am I called to defend or preach about? I had to do what David did in 1 Samuel. I had to encourage myself in the Lord. If y'all see me up here getting excited and start shouting, it's because I done figured out something. The word of God is worthy all by itself. Amen. I'm telling you tonight right now, if you have nobody else around you, the word of God in your house is good enough for you. How many know the word has delivered you, has lifted you up, and there was nobody else around but you? Yeah. Let's talk about it. He said, make sure you tell the truth. Leviticus, now, now write this text down, this is important. Leviticus 19.12, do not swear falsely by the name and so profane the name of God because I am the Lord. Here's what God is saying. Everything that is done, everything you do, I know about because I am the Lord. I control everything. Numbers 30 and 2, when a man makes a vow to the Lord, takes an oath to obligate himself, let him not forget his oath. So swearing, so the warning even goes further than that. Here we are. I love this verse in Ecclesiastes because this should make you know we are so protected by the mercy of God. We are so protected by the goodness of God. He is so interested in holding us up. When you see that, you know, that, that little uh, saying about uh, I can look back, Lord, over times in my life when I was too tired to walk and God said don't worry that's when I was carrying you yeah. don't, don't, don't think that's not true there are many days God carries us over the finish line and gives us a fresh start God's carrying somebody right now yeah, so here's what he said we got to understand because in Ecclesiastes look at the danger he said when you make a vow to God do not delay to fulfill it this NIV he has no pleasure in fools Fulfill who don't fulfill their vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. 
Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. Do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Here's what God is saying. You knew what you were saying. The caution is, if you don't intend to keep the vow, don't make it. Now, i got to talk about sanctification right here because I heard a voice saying, well, what about if I'm trying? That's not what this is saying. This, again, is talking about willful sin. Remember, when we talk about repentance, repentance means I don't want to do it again. I don't want to go back where I was. At the time I said it, God knew my heart. If I fall and slip again, God knows that. The difference is if I just make a vow because I'm in church or I'm in a setting or I think people need to hear that or I'm trying to show off, but I don't intend to keep it. I know what I said I'm going to keep it. I knew when I said I did not want to drink any more cold beer. I couldn't wait to find a liquor store. I knew I was not done with it. You know in your heart when you're done with something, and when you really have a heart of repentance, something happens in you that says, I don't want to do that again. Anybody ever had something you did and you really meant you didn't want to? I mean, you fell again, but at that moment, you almost cried yourself to death because you knew you had disappointed God. There is something about disappointing God because I can't do what I said. And so those are the moments that God carries me. But at the moment I repented, if God saw my heart, he knew. He said, my servant didn't want to do it. So I'm not talking about the times you fight and don't give up. I'm talking about the time that you have planted a direction in your life that this is a sin that I'm going to do willfully. And I'm still saved, and I'm still okay, and I'm still going to keep trying. That's not what God said. He said, it's better you don't make that vow than make it and don't fulfill it. Here's the problem. There was respect for the law. So, give you context. Jesus came on the scene. They told him, Moses said we should swear by an oath. Showed him all those scriptures. Jesus said no, but here's what I said. The problem was they had respect for the law, and it was known in biblical times that you never violated your vow or break the oath. Once the name of Yahweh was mentioned, and you swore in his hand, uh, you swore by his name. So here's what they were doing. Uh, you'll catch up with me. I'll catch up the screens. Here's what, here's what happens. I want to explain it to you. So they figured out, I'm scared of God. So they figured out, I'm going to make an oath in the name of heaven. I'm going to make an oath in the name of Jerusalem, the holy city. I'm going to make an oath. And when they couldn't make anything else, they said, I'll make an oath in my name. So what they were doing, they were, find, they were finding a way to get around the law. And the rabbis were allowing them so that they could keep money in the temple treasury. Look what happened. So it became a debt when you say it in God's name. It was an assurance your word would be kept when you said it in God's name. It was considered that you were going to have to pay, that you were going to pay it because of God. So they said, man, I can't keep finding myself messed up. So the crooked scribes and Pharisees, woe unto you, that were really interested in their uh, ill-gotten gain, their money, their status, their popularity. They were interested in that. Look what happened. When Jesus came on the scene, people began looking for loopholes. <laughs> Especially when it came to legal affairs. So if I promise to buy your property, I wouldn't swear by God that I'm going to pay you. So I wouldn't, because I didn't want to get caught up. I believe God could do something dangerous to me. So what I would do is swear by heaven, loophole. I swear by my own name, loophole. I swear by Jerusalem, loophole. That's what he said. They used the rationale that circumstances alter the case. Here, here is the lie the devil said. The circumstances that I'm saying this under alters my case. I'm not going to use God because this is not real serious, but I swear to you by my own name. Oh, watch this. So they wanted to avoid paying and feeling like they were guilty instead of swearing by the name of Yahweh, God. They began swearing by heaven, by earth, and by Jerusalem. Jesus knew that. Now you understand what this text means in, in 5.33 and 34. Look what he said. He said, this way it was slightly less serious if you did not keep your word. After a while, the religious leaders began to make all these exceptions 
that were governed by their authority or by the need for money or by some religious word. That's where Jesus got you heard. Everybody with me so far? So, uh, recap. So, you know you want to swear by God's name. It was dangerous. So, how they got around it, phony Christians, they didn't want to be obedient to God's word. Uh, I need to stop here and say this to you. If all of your life, you never want to be obedient to God's word, you don't like praise and worship, you don't like other people to really get close to you, you don't want to uh, be humble in front of other people, you always want to just have your religion in your direction, I will tell you, quite frankly, you might not be saved. Because the reality is, until sometimes in our life we allow other folks' words to guide us, we walk in love. If sometimes in our life we well, I don't do that. <laughs> what does that mean? It's in the Word of God, and you place yourself above the Word of God. I'm just not doing that. I don't have to do no crazy worship. You may not be saved. Because a sure sign of no salvation is when God can't reach your heart. Everybody in here will tell you none of us are perfect, but there are moments when God is all over my heart. There are moments when God says, I know I'm not the only one. Grown man, I've had times in my car where I cried when I broke God's heart. If you have never cried because you broke God's heart, and not just once, I wish I could tell you it was once. There's been many days when I looked at my flesh and my sinful nature, and I said, God, why do you even want somebody like but I realized that I was still trying and I wanted to be obedient. But if you get to the point that you can find a loophole, what's the loophole? Well, can't nobody tell me what to do. That's the loophole we use today. Loophole is I ain't got, I don't have, I don't feel like that. That's your will, not God's. Are you with me? So when you come into a situation and God wants to use you, who are you to tell God my will trumps your will? Watch this. Example. If you swore by Jerusalem, you were not bound. That's the text. Uh, if you swore toward Jerusalem, you were not bound. Meaning that, okay, so here's what the scribes and Pharisees said. Look at the language here. They said, well, you know what? We're going to make something up. If you swear by Jerusalem, you're not bound. If you swear toward Jerusalem, you were bound. And that's so They were making up rules. So they could get the money. So what they were saying is, we, we turned this thing into any, come on, don't look at me like that because that's the kind of walk we have now in church. That's why folk can't get along with each other. We have our own brand of religion and if it's something in the Bible I don't like, I take it out the way and follow whatever I want to follow. So look how they, look at the little tricks. If anyone swears by the temple, it meant nothing. Watch this one, y'all. But if you swear by the gold in the temple, you were bad. They loved money. This is how they had taken the oath of God and turned it into a travesty. And here's what Jesus came along and said. The swearing of oath uh, degenerated into rules to give you a way to get away with lying. Swearing eventually became a justification for lying. There's many times in my walk, God may say, forgive, I don't feel like it. Um, take some constructive criticism, not me. You gotta check your heart. Because what it means is, I have, here's Christianity, but I'm gonna set up my own little kingdom inside God's kingdom. This, this, how, this is how I'm gonna walk in the kingdom. And don't nobody say anything to me. Not the preacher, nobody better not say anything to me because this is how I'm gonna do it. We just lost God. Blow you away. Phony Christians. Keep the rules in church or of the church on the outside, but inside, I know that I'm wrong. So we say, as they did, at least I still go to church. You know, we got our own little loopholes nowadays. At least I'm still here. At least I'm trying to serve God. And those are our loopholes. I'm not as bad as others. But you have some pet sins that you have justified. But the key is, you know in your heart they're wrong. I know somebody, don't turn me off right here. Watch this. Some of you here are saying, you thought I wasn't talking about you. And then I'm kind of slipping down, you know, your driveway. Because all of us have some sins that we allow. I'm not talking about fighting. i got to make this clear. But if there's some sins and there's some pieces in your walk that you just said, it's okay for me to act like that. 
You may not be saying that's fake, that's phony. You're acting a role. How can you take half of God and not all of God? Holding grudges. I can hold a grudge. I don't like him no more. So I, I know I sing on the choir with him, but I don't like it. They go to my church. I'm, st I'm still all right. You should see what they did to me. What they should have seen what they did to me. There it is. Your will. Everything you're walking by is what somebody did to you. What about glory for God? If God said don't hold a grudge and you're holding it, oh, I know somebody don't like me. It could mean that your Christianity is fake. You're not walking what you know. All I'm telling you, it's dangerous to have little sins in your life that you know. Somebody going somebody to say, did you just say I'm going to hell? No. I said you're acting out the role and you're in danger. I didn't say it. God did. He said, if any man be saved, James 126, we saw it. My people, just because you call me Lord, Lord, I didn't say that. Jesus did. He said, the true test is will you do the will of my Father? Being evil, but still praying. Tear the house up. Come to church. One leave prayer. <laughs> uh, tear people up. Talk about people. Come to church. One. I, I got praise and worship. And let somebody tell you, you don't. Lying to escape the consequence. Guilty. Somebody said, Pastor, you sitting there confessing a the line? I'm saying that I've seen times in my life when I was not above lying to save face. And I've had to catch myself and go back and repent to God. And there are even times, I don't know, what is the farthest you've ever gone to apologize to somebody? Wow. What's, the, what's the farthest links you've ever gone to try to make a wrong right? Uh, I can remember I heard God in my heart telling me to pick this brother up in the rain. I had made this statement, I don't pick people up no more. And I, I know it's dangerous, but I knew God wanted me to pick this person. I knew them. It wasn't COVID time. <laughs> this was a time when I knew it. I didn't pick them up because I was sticking to the little vow I made myself. I didn't pick nobody else up. About maybe a mile later, God said, turn around. Go back. You know the part that hurt me? When I went back, he wasn't there. I don't know how he disappeared. When I went back, I just turned the car around maybe a mile later. I knew that was God testing my heart. You've had it happen to you. God has tested your heart. Never repent. If you never repent, how many days have you gone without repenting? This question. I've got this church stuff figured out. This is smooth sailing. That is what they thought until they heard from Jesus. Here we go. You heard what they said. I'm getting to it tonight. Jesus said, but I tell you, this is the kingdom of God, authentic Christian's attitude. Jesus said, if you want to walk right, if you want the blessings right, if you want to see what I'm really saying in my word, then you need to listen to how he took that text that they had put loopholes in and he turned it back around. Look what he said. Matthew 5, this is our text. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. God said, if you want to be saved, don't swear in it. That's where it came from. God said we should not swear because our lives are so up and down and so rocky. If you want to be saved, don't go swearing. But watch, what he, watch, watch how he gives us an out. So he said, and I see how you guys have tricked stuff up. He said, so don't swear by heaven. Say, you want to use my name, but you're going to use heaven. He said, don't swear by heaven, but this is God's throne. He said, don't swear by the earth. For it is his footstool. So here's what they said. Because I didn't do it in your name, God, I'm getting away from the penalty. He said, no. Heaven is still my throne. He said, the earth is still my footstool. Stool. And don't uh, swear by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. Now, here's the part. And definitely don't swear by yourself. Because you don't have power to put one hair black and white on your head. What swear about you going to do? And then he said, and it's the part. If you want to really, let me give you the three reasons, first of all, that he said, don't swear at all. Not by heaven, it's God's throne. Not by earth, it's God's footstool. Not by Jerusalem, it's the city of the great king. To stay honest, 
God said, if you really want to walk in his kingdom, he said, this is what I want you to do. All you need to say is simply yes and no. You know what God was saying? Just be honest. If it's something you don't like, it's something you can't do, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't lie about it. Don't take an oath about it. Don't swear about it. Just let, let somebody know. I'm not sure. Sounds good. I don't know if I can do that. Sounds good. Let your yes be yes and your no be no because when you start doing anything beyond that, the evil one comes to play because the devil then wants you to manipulate your salvation. He wants you to manipulate the way you carry God's word. Okay. All right. Let every word that come out of your mouth be the simple truth. I wish truth was simple. Truth hurts. Let your word be your truth. Don't be a name dropper. And then he warned. A warning is you will not be held guiltless if you use God's name in vain. That's where we got the title name dropper from. You want to throw God's name in it. Like I swear to you by God. I swear to God. God said, don't you, don't drop my name. You know, it's almost like uh, Marcia and I had gone to Philadelphia to one of those theaters and we sat down and sitting in front of us was Danny Glover? No, Louis Gossett Jr. Amen. Louis <laughs> Gossett Jr. was sitting in front of us. Me and Marcia, I couldn't wait to tell somebody. We went to the theater. Oh, Kimball Center. We went to the Kibble Center, and we had a conversation with Luke Gossip Jr. That man probably don't know me from Adam right now. I was dropping his name because it makes you feel like you're somebody. I know this. I know that. You know where the real power comes from? When you know God. That's who you need to know. Uh, in eternity, the only person that's going to count is when you know God. That's going to be the real, the real test. Don't vindicate yourself by swearing to God. People do this to vindicate themselves with God's blessing, name dropper. I swear to God I didn't do it. That's a name dropper trying to vindicate your own self. Don't blame God or have God co-sign your decisions. Prophecy suggests the Lord told me this is a good one. Some of the people I don't like are those people that come up to me and say, the Lord told me when, when you're not listening to them because you know what they're saying does not agree with your spirit. They will quickly say, the Lord, the Lord told me to tell you this. I got something the Lord said to tell you. You know why they do that? Because they want you to think that they have all this power. So the Lord told me to tell you. How come God didn't tell me? Amos 3, third chapter. I think it's the third verse. Somebody check it out and hold me to it. He said, I will not do anything unless I first reveal it to my prophet. Meaning that if you are saying something to me, that God has not told me, I still should have a discernment that what you're saying is true. But if what you're telling me is way out of left field, you're just trying to make me kiss your ring. I'm, I'm full of anointing. Come on, kiss my ring. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. No, people will always say, I know God sometimes in heaven, he must cringe. The Lord told me. The Lord told me. The Lord said. The Lord said. Here's what I, I found out even in my preaching. When I say the Lord said, I'm talking about what the scripture told me to tell you. We can't go around making up stuff saying God said tell you this. Because the reality is that's just name dropping to vindicate ourselves. Don't use his name to use against authority or when you feel chastised. Watch, Watch this. this. I've seen other people. people do this. As pastor, I don't want to use name. Say you're in a ministry. And the ministry leader says, do this, and you take on one of these postures. <clears throat> I don't care what they say. The Lord told me not to be a part of that. The Lord said for me to do it this way. No, let them have what they want. Listen to me. Let them do what they want. This is what I'm going to do. I don't care what the Lord told the pastor. I don't care what he told them. Look, the Lord told me not to do it. I heard him. And, and sometimes so we do it so we will... Go against authority, or sometimes when we are about to be chastised, we won't accept the chastisement by saying, I'm not even worried about what they said. That ain't what God told me to do. Name drop. Watch this. I'm not saying it's God is saying. It, it'd be better if you just say, I don't want to do that. Pray for me, Pastor, till I can get it. That's your yes is yes, your no is no. Don't blame it on God. 
When you do need this, his name, if you take it in vain, you may not, you may defer the power when you need it. Like the boy who cried wolf. When you do need God's power, you've been using his name so much, you don't even know when he shows up. Because everything out of your mouth is the Lord said. So when, it, when he really does show up to anoint you or to take you to a place of an anointing, you may not know it because you don't call him so many times in vain. Evil comes in. Ecclesiastes, don't shoot off your mouth or speak before you think. Don't be too quick to tell God what you think. He wants to hear. God's in charge, not you. That's a good verse. Uh, five and two says, what you need to realize is God's in charge. So everything I'm saying here is not a, a offense against the church or attack against me. I'm dealing with the fact that God said, you're a phony or fake Christian. Um, you're full of dead man bones. You're good on the outside, but you're lawlessness in your... All God is saying is, you can't be a Christian on the outside if you're name dropping or if you're swearing and taking oaths when you don't have the power to do it. He said, I'd rather you just be honest. Work out your salvation. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Let's look at this. Proverbs 10, 19. The more talk, the less truth. The wise measure their words. That's the message Bible that um, I, I told someone that as a preacher, I've messed up so many times over the last few years of my pastor and tenure. I've said the wrong thing. I've said some things that drove people out of church. I've said some things that I thought was right. I wasn't doing it vindictively or maliciously, but I didn't think before I said it, and it had a negative effect. I don't think I'm the only one. Many of us have said some words that we know we shouldn't have said until after we said them. And then when the words came out, we found ourselves in a position that it wasn't blessing God or us. Oh, I don't want to go to eye for an eye. Let's finish this. So real Christians versus phony Christians is telling us that we have to measure our words. So to recap, they had taken and found loopholes to the Christianity and they were name dropping, they were swearing, and they had messed up the swearing so much that God said, don't take an oath. Now, let me answer this question I said I was going to answer. Next week, we're going to go to an eye for an eye, a two for two. Oh, you're going to be excited about that. I'm going to share with you what God says about that um, waiving our rights for other folks. It's going to be a good one. But anyway, watch this. This does not literally mean swearing. It's the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. Meaning, he didn't say when you go into a, a, a courthouse, you can't lay your hand on the Bible and swear. The reality of this text, and some people take it literally, but the biblical application of this is taking an oath and not keeping it, is the swearing God is talking about. It translates into what we call swearing. Now, if you don't feel comfortable swearing, you don't have to. I myself have to. Because I, I, taught, I was taught this as a child not to swear, I affirm. I don't swear. And you can be comfortable doing that. But please, I've given you the background and the context of the text. The context is God's more concerned about whether you're trying to be phony or you're trying to follow the law. Are you following authentic Christianity or are you doing it your way? Let, own up to it. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Come on, give God praise tonight. Uh, we're going to pick up next week. This is an exciting series we're in. And these next few lessons are going to be talking to us. And this one, one tonight, I hope somebody has figured something out. Please apply this to yourself. Don't set up your own little kingdom of Christianity because what you're doing now is taking God's name in vain because you've designed your own way to live. We need to make sure we do what Jesus said. Let my yes be yes and my no be no. Let truth come out of my mouth. And if I'm not there yet, don't make myself look good. Just say, God, I got a little bit more weight. I got a little bit further to go. This Pastor Duncan saying, I want to pray for you tonight as we close. Phony Christian or real Christian? Did you check a box? Were you like me? There were some checks all over. <laughs> and you're going to work on it? The danger is, make sure your heart is not so hard that you won't trade your will for God's. Let's pray. Father God, tonight we want you to be pleased with us. Father, there's some things that I've been allowing in my life 
that have been keeping me from the blessing you had for me. I surrender my heart and my mind, Lord. If I held a grudge, if I, if I set up something that I know is against your word, please tear it down. I don't want any strongholds to stop me from being who you, I love you, God, who you call me to be. I love you, God, who you want me to be. I love you, God. Father, I can't make this journey without you. So tonight, in the name of Jesus, change our heart to follow the command of God's word. Let's not swear that we can do anything without the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tonight, if there's somebody here not saved, say these words after me. Say, Lord God, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose again from the cross with all power in your hands because I believe it and because I say I am saved. If you pray that prayer, go somewhere, meditate on those words, go into the Bible, look at John 3.16, see what Jesus said, something will come alive in your heart and you will be a brand new Christian. If you receive the Lord, here's what we need you to do. Please call this number. Someone's there now to pick up your call. We'll stand you by or send us an email to sbcsalvation at gmail.com. sbcsalvation at gmail.com. And you will, will, will help you and guide you through your new walk. And if you want to become a member, go to our website, www.shilobaptistchurches.org. www.shilobaptistchurches.org. One church in two locations, .org, and you can fill out your membership. During this time of COVID, you can become a member of our church, no matter what your geographic location. God bless you. This is Pastor Duncan saying, have a great night. And next week, stay tuned for our continuation of this exciting series, Walking in the Kingdom of God.